British Columbia, Canada, Constitution Act, 1996. The Constitution Act of British Columbia, Article 4, Appointment to Public Office. The appointment to public office under the government of British Columbia, whether vacant or created, and whether salaried or not, is vested in the Lieutenant Governor with the advice of the Executive Council. A of the officials who are also appointed members of the Executive Council, which appointments are vested in the Lieutenant Governor alone. In the Constitution Act of British Columbia, Article 4, it states that appointment to public office in BC, British Columbia, is vested in the Lieutenant Governor, okay, with the advice of the Executive Council. So, the power to appoint public officers in BC comes from the Lieutenant Governor. That's very clear. Now it says that from the Lieutenant Governor with the advice of the Executive Council. So, so there is something called the Executive Council that gives advice to the Lieutenant Governor concerning the appointments of public officers in British Columbia. But nevertheless, the power the right to take such action or the duties, the responsibilities, are vested in the Lieutenant Governor. To appoint a public official in the operation of the Government of Canada or the Government of British Columbia, the power or the duty to do this rests in the Lieutenant Governor and the Executive Council. So, two different classes of persons, or two different organizations, or two different structures. Now, this executive council that advises the lieutenant governor, the officials that are appointed to the, to the executive council are appointed into this position by the lieutenant governor general of the province alone. The lieutenant governor he has the power to appoint the officials into the Executive Council. And then the ones that he appoints, the ones that he gives the job to, will then advise him concerning the appointment of the other public officials in Canada. So this whole executive power is extremely controlled, all by the Lieutenant Governor. He's sitting at the top of this. The Constitution Act of British Columbia, Article 7. Executive power continues so far as it is unalterated by this Act. The Constitution Act of British Columbia, Article 9. The Executive Council is composed of the persons, persons the Lieutenant Governor appoints, including the Premier of British Columbia, who is President of the Executive Council. The Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia, he appoints the public officials. Now, this power is given to him, or comes to him, through the Constitution Act of Canada, 1867 and 1982. Now, the Executive Council of British Columbia is appointed, the members thereof, are appointed by the Lieutenant Governor. And the President of this Executive Council is the Premier of British Columbia, who is also appointed by the Governor General into this position. Now, each one of these positions, okay, they have powers and duties attached to it. Each one. There's powers and duties that are attached to the role, or to the office. So we have the Lieutenant Governor, who has powers and duties that are attached to the role or to his office. We have the Executive Council, whatever they may be. I'm not going to qualify it in this video, but we have the Executive Council, and they have powers and duties that are attached to them. And we also have the Premier of British Columbia, and we know the Premier of British Columbia has powers and duties attached to that role or office. British Columbia Constitution, Article 10. Any of the powers and duties assigned by law to any of the officials 
constituting the Executive Council may, by order and council, be assigned and transferred for any period to any other of the officials. If any or all of the powers and duties of an official are transferred to another, the official to whom the powers and duties are transferred may exercise the powers and perform the duties under his or her own title, or the title of the official from whom the powers and duties are transferred. We know the Queen, Her Majesty, in right of Canada, is the Sovereign of Canada, and she's passed some of her power on to the executive power that is in operation here in Canada which starts with the Governor General of Canada and stems from him to the Lieutenant Governors of each subsequent province. The Lieutenant Governor, as a representative of the Queen, is responsible and has burdens to bear concerning the human rights and fundamental freedoms that should be in operation here in Canada. Now, he has an Executive Council and in British Columbia, the Premier of the province sits on this executive council as president and this executive council has powers and duties that are assigned okay they use the word specifically assigned that are assigned to the executive council by law to these officials so they have powers and duties that are assigned to them by law now these powers and duties can be assigned and transferred for any period to any other official. So whatever powers and duties are in operation in this Executive Council that is advising the Governor General or the Lieutenant Governor General, these powers and duties, they can then be taken and transferred out of the Executive Power or out of the Executive Council and given to any other official who is operating in the right of Canada on behalf of Her Majesty. Any or all of the powers and duties that the Executive Council holds can be transferred. They can, they can transfer those rights and duties right out of the Executive Council. They can transfer them to any other official. And that official who receives the power those duties, the rights, those responsibilities, they may exercise those powers under their own title. So, for example, just giving you an example, the Executive Council transfers out a certain power to the Ministry of Welfare. Just giving you an example, social welfare. Well, now, that ministry, that minister, under his own title, should be exercising the power or the duty that has been transferred to him. Or, whatever power and duty has been transferred, the new minister who gets the power, the new public official who gets the power, can operate it under the title from where the power came from. So they can keep the title where it's coming from, or they can exercise it under their own ministry, under their own title. So what we're seeing happening here is that the powers, the duties, and I'm more referring to human rights and fundamental freedoms, the powers and duties that the Executive Council holds or have responsibility towards, such as the international obligations, whatever they are supposed to be doing, the actions that they are supposed to be taking, can be transferred out of the Executive Council into different titles or ministers of the government. And we will not even know. Unless we go to the minister for each department and read through the powers that he's been granted to see that if somewhere in the powers that he has been granted the fundamental human rights and freedoms that were their responsibility were now transferred to him through the enactment and hidden the Constitution Act of British Columbia article 14 if under section 10 or 13 powers, duties, and functions of an official or ministry are transferred to another official or ministry, the lieutenant governor in council may order that all or part of the money authorized by the legislator to be paid and applied for the purpose of those powers, 
duties and functions and remaining unexpended be expended by and through the other official or ministry to whom or to which those powers, duties and functions are transferred and that money may be expended for those powers, duties and functions. All of the power, duties and functions that are transferred out of the Executive Council and into another public official, whatever powers they are transferring, includes all of the money that is authorized to be paid and applied for the very purpose of the power, duties and functions. So I'll stick with human rights, for example, and freedoms, fundamental human rights and freedoms. Those powers are transferred out of the Executive Council into a minister and the money that goes to supply those rights and freedoms, the money, is transferred along with those powers. And now it becomes the minister's right, obligation, responsibility, duty or function to deal with this situation. But through this operation of law, through this transfer, we don't know what powers and duties are being negated to this minister and that minister. The only way you'll ever tell or be able to understand what powers have been negated left and right is by going directly to the enactment that applies directly to the minister and then read it and see what's going on. What powers have been conferred upon him? Did he receive any executive powers from the, from the executive council? Can we see that any of those executive powers were trans Ferred into his office, and if it was, which ones were they? Are they applicable to my human rights? If not, great. Leave me alone, this minister. I have nothing to do with you. On to the next minister. The Constitution Act of British Columbia, Article 21, 23, and 24. The Lieutenant Governor must, by proclamation, in Her Majesty's name, summon and talk, call together the Legislative Assembly. The Lieutenant Governor may by proclamation in Her Majesty's name, prorogue or dissolve the Legislative Assembly when the Lieutenant Governor sees fit. Oath of Allegiance. A member of the Legislative Assembly must not vote or sit until he or she has taken and subscribed the following oath before the Lieutenant Governor, or some other person authorized by the Lieutenant Governor to administer the oath. I swear by that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God." So we see in the Constitution Act of British Columbia that the Lieutenant Governor, he's the one who calls the Assembly together. And we also see that it's the Lieutenant Governor who has the power to make by proclamation an order to dissolve Parliament. We actually saw this in operation in Canada recently when Harper, a few years ago, went before the Governor General of Canada and asked her to dissolve Parliament, and she did. It's the Lieutenant Governor who has that power. Now, it's also these officials, or public officials, when they get into office, they have to take an oath of allegiance. As you see, it's an oath to Her Majesty to serve her. Now they have to do it before the governor, Lieutenant Governor General of the province or it states before another person authorized to do this by the Lieutenant Governor. So here's another example of powers and duties and functions being transferred. So we have the Lieutenant Governor whose role and function is to take the oath of, have the oath of allegiance taken before him. Now instead of him doing it, he transfers that power to another person. Wow, it almost tickles my heart so much to see how much sharing there is going on within the government of Canada, the public officials. They share, their tra they share and transfer their duties, their responsibilities and their functions in between one another. It's nice to see. It's too bad that those public officials do not share with the rest of the Canadians their fundamental human rights and freedoms. The Constitution Act of Canada, 1867, Article 14. It shall be lawful for the Queen, if Her Majesty thinks fit, to authorize the Governor-General from time to time to appoint any person 
or any persons jointly or severally to be his deputy or deputies within any part or parts of Canada, and in that capacity to exercise during the pleasure of the Governor General such of the powers, authorities, and functions of the Governor General as the Governor General deems it necessary or expedient to assign to him or them subject to any limitations or directions expressed or given by the Queen, but the appointment of such deputy or deputies shall not affect the exercise by the Governor General himself of any power, authority, or function. My, you guys love to share a lot. The way our Constitution Act of Canada reads in 1867, it's lawful for Her Majesty the Queen, at the time it was Queen Victoria, obviously it wasn't Queen Elizabeth II, but nevertheless the rights and duties transferred out of Victoria into Queen Elizabeth, but it would be lawful for the Queen to transfer duties uh, and functions to the Governor General, or he, she could bypass the Governor General and transfer whatever rights and duties or functions that she wanted to into any other official without the authorization of the Governor General. She could bypass it. So Her Majesty transfers duties and responsibilities to the Governor General or to any official she chooses. The Governor General then has his duties and, and the responsibilities, he transfers them to persons or officials he wants to. And the, the Executive Council, they also transfer their duties and functions to persons or officials. And you want to go one level more? These persons and officials, they transfer their duties between one another. Now this is all being done, why? I proclaim the objective of all this, why it was all done, was to hide our fundamental rights concerning our human rights and freedoms. Because by doing all this, they are transferring duties, transferring roles, transferring functions between offices, between ministers. It gets extremely, extremely difficult to track down what the heck has transpired here in Canada. The Interpretation Act of Canada, Rules of Construction, Article 8.1. Both the common law and civil law are equally authoritative and recognized sources of the law of property and civil rights in Canada and unless otherwise provided by law. If in interpreting an enactment it is necessary to refer to province rules, principles or concepts. When we look at the, into the Interpretation Act of Canada, which applies in British Columbia, you find that common law is an authoritative in Canada, especially in British Columbia. Now when you read an enactment, a law that has been given force of law through royal assent, these statutes, when you read them, you must read them with common law terminology in your mind. It says common law terminology must be adopted when you read these enactments. British Columbia Constitutional Questions Act Notice of Questions of Validity or Applicability Article 8 In this section, constitutional remedy means a remedy under Section 24.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms other than a remedy consisting of the exclusion of evidence or consequential on such exclusion. The Canadian Constitution Act of Canada, 1982, Article 24, Subsection 1. Anyone whose rights or freedoms, as guaranteed by this Charter, have been infringed or denied, may apply to a court of competent jurisdiction to obtain such remedy as the court considers appropriate and just in the circumstances. The Constitutional Question Act of British Columbia now remember, when reading enactments, you have to keep common law interpretation with inside of your mind. It says that a constitutional remedy in this enactment is any remedy that you're looking for that comes out of Section 24 of the Canadian Constitution of Rights and Freedoms. And when we look into the Canadian Constitution of Rights and Freedoms, it starts off like this. It says, anyone. So the subject, the designation, or the player being brought forth here is anyone. Therefore, a human being can be anyone. 
A person can be anyone, an official can be anyone, a man can be anyone. Nevertheless, anyone whose rights and freedoms as guaranteed by this charter, if they have been denied or infringed, can make a claim. So the Constitutional Question Act says that if you claim as in anyone that your rights and freedoms that were guaranteed in the Charter have been infringed or removed, you have the right to do so under this Act. If in a cause, matter, or other proceeding, the constitutional validity or constitutional applicability of any law is challenged or an application is made for a constitutional remedy. The law must not be held to be invalid or inapplicable and the remedy must not be granted until after notice of the challenging of the challenge or application has been served on the Attorney General of Canada and the Attorney General of British Columbia in accordance with this section. If in a cause, matter, or other proceeding the validity or applicability of a regulation is challenged on grounds other than the grounds referred to in subsection 2.a. The regulation must not be held to be invalid or inapplicable until after notice of the challenge has been served on the Attorney General of British Columbia in accordance with this section. The notice must be headed in the cause, matter, or other proceeding, state the law in question or the right or freedom alleged to be infringed or denied. I read in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Article 2, that everyone has the freedom of association. And I understand that the Canadian citizen is a subject, a servant of Her Majesty, held in association with the monarch empire. Now, I'm going to go and make a constitutional challenge and say that I have the right to association. Now, the law must not be held invalid or unapplicable against me, meaning they can't give me a judgment, and the remedy must not be granted, they can't give me a judgment, until after, notice that, until after the challenge or application has been served on the Attorney General of Canada and British Columbia. So, we know common law is an expression that is in operation here in Canada. And we know from the Interpretation Act of Canada, it states that when we read these enactments, we should keep common law predominant in our mind. So when I'm reading the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is an act, an enactment, that's been given force of law, nevertheless, there's many beautiful freedoms that are in that Charter, I'm keeping common law in my mind. And as a man or as a human being, I do know that I have the right to freedom of association. And you guys, the Canadian government, have bound me into a position of servitude and association through my person, that role, that designation, Canadian citizen. Now I'm going to express my common law right using the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of Canada. And I'm going to lay a constitutional challenge and I'm going to say that you do not have the right to force me into association, into that personhood, or into that Canadian citizen role. And doing so, I'm going to send my application or my challenge to the Attorney General of Canada and BC of my province. And that's my obligation, because if I don't do that, then the remedy that I'm seeking for, which is saying that it's invalid and it's unapplicable for you to hold me in association with that Canadian citizen, in association with the, monarch, with the empire of the monarchy, it's, it won't be heard. They'll throw it down. There's an obligation that you must serve them. In the Constitutional Questions Act, again, it says that any remedy against them, we have to go through Article 24 of the Canadian Constitution of Rights and Freedoms, or Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That's what it states. But it also states this, or on any other grounds besides Article 24, that we can launch a challenge against them. Well, let's look, for example, at the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Article 26. 
The Constitution Act of Canada, 1982, Article 26. The guarantee in this Charter of certain rights and freedoms shall not be construed as denying the existence of any other rights and freedoms that exist in Canada. Hopefully those who have followed my videos already know what Article 26 says. So you can launch, launch a challenge there, drawing on your rights, saying, well, you want to get down to the meat of all this? I'm drawing on Article 6 and Article 16 of the International Covenants where it states that I don't have to take recognition as that person, as that Canadian citizen, the subject to Her Majesty. And Article 26 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms grants me the right to call upon that. Now I'm going to launch, launch my constitutional challenge against what it, whatever it is you're trying to yoke me to. There's a few ways <clears throat> to get your human rights and fundamental freedoms expressed here in Canada. Actually, there's more than a few ways. It just comes to fully understanding exactly what they've done and how they're playing around with all of this in Canada. Instead of teaching us and showing us and allowing us and honoring them, they're hiding them and lying and transferring and being dishonest. That's the government.